All right, thank you. Well, it's good to uh, good to see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, this is a, a new project for me, so I definitely welcome your comments and suggestions for uh, directions I can take with this this project. Uh, <clears throat> so, several administrative procedures have been implemented with the goal of improving patent quality, and there have been several recent Supreme Court cases and Federal <laughs> Circuit decisions that also seem to be a response to patent quality concerns. And the goal of this project is to study and understand issues regarding patent quality in an enforcement context. Uh, in other words, I'm mainly interested in a patentee's view of patent quality and a patentee's response to these new quality initiatives. For example, what is a patentee's idea of patent quality and given an understanding of the type of patent quality a patentee would like to aspire to, are there procedures that we can put in place to increase patent quality? Is this something that we should even be worried about? And is this something that the patent system uh, should take on as a goal? So there are various ways to understand patent quality and measure patent quality. And a lot of work in this area has, uh, has already been done. Uh, there's a body of literature that suggests, at least, that there's a correlation between litigated patents and the quality of those patents. And some of the characteristics shared by the patents in those studies include, for example, longer prosecution times. Uh, these patents tend to have more claims. Uh, these patents tend to have more forward and backward citations. And they're more likely to be a continuation or a continuation in part application. And partly in response to some of the empirical work um, I mentioned that's been done by uh, Allison, Lindley, and Chen, and others, we've seen activity at the legislative, administrative, and judicial levels that either directly respond to some of these concerns regarding patent quality or have been perceived to respond to concerns about patent quality. Uh, for example, because of the AIA, the USPTO uh, introduced post-grant review, covered business methods review, and revamped inter-parties review. Uh, Professor Merges is one who, uh, of many who has argued that these administrative processes are valuable because it allows <coughs> the third parties who will be affected most by bad quality patents to intervene in the process. In addition, within the last uh, decade, uh, we've seen the Supreme Court weigh in on obviousness, patentable subject matter, uh, paragraph 112 issues, I'm sorry, 112 issues, paragraph, uh, paragraphs 2, uh, paragraph 6, and recently uh, in the Williamson's case, which was about 112 paragraph 6, the federal, cir federal Circuit has seemingly made it more difficult, uh, or harder at least, for some functional claims to survive scrutiny. And I think a lot, a lot of people would argue that that's probably a good thing. Um, and according to one study completed by uh, Allison, these decisions address grounds upon which many of the most common invalidity arguments are made. Despite all of these uh, changes uh, and new programs, uh, Paul Wagner, for example, argues, and I, I agree with him to a certain extent, is that patent quality is ultimately in the hands of the patentee. Um, and in his paper, Understanding Patent Quality Mechanisms, he characterizes this problem as garbage in, garbage out. Uh, more specifically, patent quality is in the hands of the lawyers and patent agents who draft patents and patent claims. Accordingly, some attention must be paid to these individuals, these patentees. However, it would be incomplete to say that claims they produce are created uh, in a vacuum. And so the real system is a, a, is a bit more uh, elaborate. Uh, control theory is about one of the only things that I remember from my electrical engineering background in education. Um, so I've tried to, to create a model based on that, and in the system, patent applications, more specifically patent claims, are uh, an input generated by a patentee, 
and the USPTO's output are those granted patents. And we know that a small, very small percentage, 1 to 2% of those uh, output are subject to greater scrutiny uh, in the courts through uh, litigation. And the courts, upon evaluating a patent, provide some feedback into this system. Now, this feedback is compared to uh, some reference value, if you remember control theory at all, that reference value is sort of the ideal output. This is what you want to happen. This is what you want the system to produce. And so in this case, we let this reference value represent an ideal patent written according to uh, the statute and established patent doctrine uh, that is valid uh, and enforceable and potentially infringed. And so the comparison, the comparison with what we get from the judicial system with this reference value yields for patent agents and patent uh, lawyers these best practices which they then use to draft future applications. Now there are some issues with modeling it in this way, um, and this has been written about a little bit. Uh, the idea, your idea of a quality patent depends upon, very much upon, who you are, right? Uh, for the USPTO, uh, a quality patent is a patent that ba basically meets the statutory requirements, the baseline statutory requirements. For courts, it might be a valid patent with clear claim scope that allows a court uh, to determine whether or not a patent is infringed. And for the patentee, it's a valid patent with clear claim scope uh, that might also be infringed. And this all aligns with a recent article written by uh, Christy, I'm going to butcher her last name, Garini, uh, that suggests that shifting perspective from increasing the amount of valid patents to increasing the amount of good quality patents uh, is something that we want to do. And so again, I fully recognize uh, that all patents do not have to rise to this level of, uh, to be useful or for some incentives of the patent system to be justified. Further, maybe we don't want a system that encourages these types of, of patents, uh, given the unpopularity of the patent licensing business model. Nevertheless, I still believe it's an area where some sort of uh, academic inquiry. <clears throat> and so, for example, uh, and for the purposes of, of this, this forum, uh, I want to discuss one sort of qualitative discussion about these types of patents that I'll mention and refers to uh, what uh, a gentleman by the name of Larry Goldstein, who is a practitioner, refers to as litigation-proof patents. Uh, and he has a book, uh, he's coined this phrase, he has a book by the, by the same name, and Goldstein argues that litiga a litigation-proof patent must have at least three attributes. It must be valid, it must have broad scope, and there must be discoverability of infringement. And these basic qualities of uh, broad scope and enforceability have also been uh, echoed by other uh, academics. So what are some specific characteristics of uh, these litigation-proof patents? Some characteristics of these patents include general claim terms that can cover uh, multiple uh, implementations, uh, defining key claim terms that are adequately claimed and described, uh, and for method and system claims in particular, uh, they, these claims can only be uh, infringed by a single actor. And uh, in his book, Mr. Goldstein points to a patent of which we're almost at least somewhat familiar, the slide to click patent, as an example of a patent that most embodies those principles. So Apple's slide to click patent is, is the example that he gives of a quote unquote litigation proof patent. All right, so how do we, uh, how do we get to or acquire these types of patents or how are these types of patents created? And I think we can start with validity um, as a baseline since we have evidence of what works uh, with respect to uh, obtaining uh, higher quality patents with respect to whether or not they're invalid or not. And there are several uh, processes, uh, iterative process, processes, that seem to drive uh, quality of claims. 
So if you look at supplemental examination, broadening your issue, continuation in part, those are all iterative in that the, uh, the patentee is getting sort of a second bite of the apple, uh, except within the limited context of, um, of course, he can't go back and add new subject matter in a continuation, but might be able to add new subject matter in a continuation in part. In addition, the USPTO's programs, IPR, PGR, CBM, those are all also uh, somewhat iterative in that it's a trial by fire. And as uh, most people know in this room, if, you're, uh, if your patent survives uh, any type of re-exam, uh, the patent, the general perception is that that patent is strengthened by that. So how do we go from uh, using these iterative processes to create simply valid patents to, again, what uh, Goldstein referred to as litigation, uh, litigation proof patents? Uh, well, for one, uh, it starts with, with plain clarity. And one of the suggestions that uh, if you uh, if you talk to uh, a gentleman by the name of Hal Wagner for more than 10 to 15 minutes, uh, that he will bring up, blame, uh, bring up is uh, a call for uh, reimposing uh, claim drafting during the USPTO exam. He, this was once included in the uh, USPTO uh, patent bar exam. It was removed. Now it's all multiple choice. Uh, but he, he suggests that if we simply add a claim drafting portion back onto this exam, uh, then uh, people would, uh, patent, uh, patent agents and patent lawyers would be forced to study the art of claim drafting and therefore draft uh, better claims. There are also additional USPT PTO proposals uh, regarding claim clarity. Uh, among those are uh, generic claim templates for an applicant to follow. In addition, uh, requiring an applicant uh, to define claim terms. I know several friends of mine that are uh, patent agents and patent attorneys right now that would probably resist, uh, resist the, the, uh, the argument that they need to define all their claim terms uh, in their application. Yet, that's still a proposal that's out there. Uh, my initial view, um, and I, I definitely would like comments and feedback on this, is that uh, these all these proposals are helpful, but it also there also might be a way to use some iterative approaches to improve claim clarity. Um, and one of them that, that jumps out at me, probably because I've written a lot about it, is the the joint infringement uh, joint infringement problem. Is there is there a simple way in which uh, <clears throat> We can, through the process of drafting of, of examination, alert uh, patent agents, alert patent attorneys that their patents uh, might not, uh, might not uh, adhere to uh, what we call the single infringer test. Right? And finally, a larger question, which I, I still don't quite know the answer to, is should we even, uh, should we even um, be aspiring to create these quote unquote litigation uh, proof patents for, uh, for various reasons. All right, so I will, uh, I'll stop there and uh, take uh, questions and comments. Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. I, I, I think <coughs> that the chart with the bar graphs and then the red circle, I, I think I disagree with that. I mean, an ideal patent to a patentee is different than an ideal patent to a uh, somebody at the USPTO with respect to how <clears throat> carefully I adhere to the statutory requirements. I mean, ideally, I want one that's just barely valid because it's extremely vague and extremely broad. And I think the USPTO wants one that's very narrow, very clear, highly defined. And so I, I haven't read that book, but I, I don't know if, any, if he's a practitioner, if he engages in this obvious tension between what, you know, one of the questions you don't have there, ideal to whom, really maybe the USPTO is, is a proxy for this, but to society, right? The, the, the ideal path for society would balance all of these things exactly appropriately. Um, but I, I, I wonder if you've engaged in that tension that really I, I, don't, I don't want a very clear patent. I don't want one that's very clear boundaries uh, if I'm the patentee. 
Yeah, no, as, as you know, I struggle with that uh, quite a bit actually because when I was drafting patent applications, my goal was certainly different from uh, the goal of the examiner in that, in that, you know, I want to keep, I don't want to define all my claim terms. I want to keep my claim terms as broad and general as possible. The USPTO wants, wants more clarity. So I think the chart, the chart, the to is cost. Right. And and the chart may be, the bar graph might have not been an appropriate, appropriate image to show. I guess what I was trying to emphasize there is that depending on who you are, your idea of a quality patent is definitely going to vary. Yeah. And, and your interests and incentives. Yeah. So, so, so two thoughts. One is the first is I think you really have two separate projects here. One which is, to me, very interesting, which is describing the ways that the iterative feedback mechanisms that go and affect patent quality, however we define that. And I think it's actually a lot more complicated than the, the control flow chart you put up there, right? Because you've got multiple feedback mechanisms within the prosecution process. You've got the, the prosecution process getting reviewed by the BPAI or the PTAB and then Federal Circuit review of that. And I think uh, Jonathan Mazur and Lisa Ouellette have a whole debate about, you know, the that kind of mechanism and what's going on there and whether that's a good mechanism or it's thrown off and gone off the rails. And so that's one project and, and that's all about what are the different mechanisms that provide feedback to attorneys when they're drafting or clients when they're drafting these patent applications to produce whatever it is that a quality patent is. The second project is about what is patent quality really and I, I definitely agree with Lucas about this that it's a really hard concept, and it's nowhere near as simple as kind of the, the three simple bar charts. Um, there's an obvious tension, for example, between validity and, and infringement, right, and scope. And there's also a tension between um, clarity and scope, or uh, clarity of scope and infringement and validity, right? So there's all these things are in tension. As you push down on one, you're going to push up on the other, and so. And reaching that balance of what actually is a high quality patent, I think to me, has the audience problems that Lucas is talking about, but also has these internal tensions going on. And that's, to me, a really, really hard problem. Um, and I, I really like your, your, your work in progress concept. I really like the, what are the feedback mechanisms, and kind of digging into that, um, to me, is like, that would be a, a great thing to better understand, because I don't really have everything kind of fit together. Yes, I think it's just uh, uh, maybe a mistake to assume that the PTO has any interest in quality patents. <laughs> um, there are obviously a lot of reasons why people want patents that have absolutely nothing to do with innovation. Um, and I think if you're doing this kind of work, and agreeing particularly in the feedback loops, it would be fascinating to follow that through. Um, I think we have to recognize that we can't set the PTO up as sort of the creator of quality because if their interest is to issue a lot of patents, uh, it may not be necessarily the issue of value. What do they care about value? They care about fees, one can argue. Um, so I think, it, it, I, again, in terms of broadening the scope of your paper, I think it's important not to black box these entities and make sure that the patent agent, the patent attorney has a set of uh, incentives that may in fact have absolutely nothing to do with quality, as does the PTO. So just along the lines of some of the earlier comments, I think there's some interesting things going on here within the patent office that would be very uh, fruitful to explore and the feedback mechanisms within the patent office. And um, I, I think that, that unpacking a little bit of the motivations inside the patent office might, might in particular be fruitful. I think there may be a disconnect between the motivations of examiners and the rule makers within the patent office. I think the rule makers within the patent office, um, their administrators and their interest is, is um, certainly one of, of kind of least resistance sometimes and, and keeping the, the trains running on time, even if that means there's lots and lots of trains. Examiners, I think, sometimes have different interests. I think one of the interests of examiners is to work at the patent office for a few years before they can go get a high paying job. <laughs> and, and that creates a different incentive um, in that they don't care about the rules in a different way, but they want the rules to be those that favor them on the other side mm -hmm. and once they move forward. So um, I think unpacking that would be very interesting to see what feedback mechanisms are lacking. Uh, who was it that was presenting on empirical piece on that? Uh, it was West it? Virginia. Uh, sure. Sean, Sean too is doing does, oh, does, okay. has got a project on that. Okay. Uh, you can check on that.
All right, great. Thank you very much.